heavily involved. Yeah. Um, probably One because there are women running around, but that's another story entirely. Yeah. One of the things to remember, and this is, I'm not making a, a judgment here, but we, uh, we, we were in the Catholic school educational system. So right through grade school and high school, it was Catholicism, and there was a certain amount of sheltering going on. Uh, we broke out of that, fortunately. Yes, I, I understand. Uh, I, I'm a victim of 12 years of Catholic school myself. Uh, we weren't we weren't really sheltered. There was a lot going on at the time, but uh, especially in the late 60s. Yeah. Uh, so um, I went up to see hair when it first opened. I got taken to New York. We went to see hair. You were there, too. I was there, too. Together. Yes. Wait, we went together. We did because I can tell your story that you're about to tell about going up on stage. I don't remember it. You tell it. You, you don't remember the story? You were wearing this leather vest that you were very, very yeah. fond of. And at the end of the show, this was the Broadway production of Hair. At the end of the show, they bring people up on stage, you know, to dance around or, or whatever. And, you know, Michael and I being who we are, we went up on stage and he was dancing with somebody. I couldn't tell you who, but they turned to him and said, nice vest. You want to sell it? <laughs> I don't I, now that you mention it, I vaguely remember it. I couldn't tell you if it was a guy or a girl who asked me. <laughs> I guess I didn't time my drugs correctly that night. Right. Yeah, well, there was that. I remember hair. That was fun. Yeah, it was a that was a, a fun. It was an interesting moment in my in my life anyway. I mean, it it certainly left a mark. Yeah. So, well. <laughs> so you guys got out of high school and. Um, I know you, you, Bill, at least had a, a brief stint in college before uh, deciding that life, there were other more interesting things in life. What did you do after high school before stage rig or sepsis rigging came into existence? Was, was that for me, Eddie? Yeah, that was, let's start with you. Um, what did I do? I did a lot did of remember? stuff. Try um, remember, Bill. Oh, you're going to just, you're going to start and you're going to, okay, fine, fine. Did anybody time it how long it took him to start getting in my face? Um, I, I quit school in 72 and I got very, very lucky. I got an opportunity to work at the University of Pennsylvania, the Zellerbach Theater. Um, they had just opened the building two years before and they were doing in-house productions. They were you know, a producing company, but they also brought in tryouts. Broadway shows were still trying out back in those days out of town. And they brought in, for the two years that I was there, uh, they brought in the Phoenix Company with Hal Prince and the New York Shakespeare Festival with Joe Papp. Um, I have the dubious honor of um, having uh, babysat Joe Papp's kids on several occasions. So... <laughs> So I was exposed to some extraordinary theater. And I was exposed to some extraordinary technical people. Um, some of the people in the room may remember Pete Feller Sr. Uh, I met Pete uh, early on and I got to work with him in Philly. And then when I moved to New York, I got to work with Pete in New York. Um, Did you work at the shop for Pete? I worked in the shop. I worked my first on stage load in work, uh, you know, daily work call thing was a chorus line uh, at the Schubert. So Is I was in Pete's shop. In the you the hatch story? Yeah. Oh, the hatch story. That's what, that's what got me to in introduce to Pete. When we were doing, uh, when they started doing load ins in Philly, uh, the house staff, which was a non-union staff, got to work with the union, the, the local, the IA local, because when the New York guys came in, the house went uh, local, uh, IA. So we got to work with them and, and started, I started my career learning a very good lesson in, in doubling. Uh, <laughs> so I was getting, I was, I was getting a, a, a salary from the university and I was getting paid for the load in too. But what would happen is Pete would sit out in the house yelling at people, you know, telling them to do this, do that. And, you know, there's 25, 30 people on stage. And he kept saying, hey, you, 
and then four or five people would turn around him and he'd have to figure out who he wanted to do what. I was working with a leather hat, but I didn't wear it on my head. I wore it, you know, on my back. It had a chin strap, so I hung on my back. So after a little while, he started, instead of saying, hey, you, and having four people turn around, he started saying, hey, you, with the hat. So I worked my ass off, but he knew who I was. When I quit Penn and went to work in New York City, um, moved into my apartment, paid all the bills and stuff, and I had a month before I was going to see another bill, $11 to my name coming out of the change jar. Um, I went down to the Schubert Theater and walked on stage, tapped him on the shoulder and said, I need a job. And he pointed, and, I, and I, was, I was thinking about this. John, maybe you would remember, John McGraw, maybe you would remember his driver's name, who was so, he was a, his famous driver who took Pete around and, and, and just, you know, knew everybody. Unfortunately, I can't remember his name, but Pete pointed at him and said, get in the car. And up to the Bronx, I went. And I worked in the Bronx. And then I took, um, I was part of the, the people who moved from the Bronx up to Newburgh when he moved his shop up there. Wow, that's cool. Mike, yeah. what did you do after high school? What did I do after high school? It's a more convoluted path. You got a couple minutes? Yeah, oh, yeah, we got an hour and a half. <laughs> um, all right, I'll try and keep it brief. Uh, two years in the philosophy program at Temple University, 70 to 72. 72 and 73, uh, I spent either at an apartment in Philadelphia and just working or hitchhiking around the country. I ended up uh, going, you know, I, I left Temple University after two years, ended up in University of Cincinnati Engineering School uh, in 74 or 75, I don't remember which, and lasted there two weeks because I was in the wrong program. Uh, within a year, without making a big deal out of it, I ended up at the Conservatory of Music, uh, University of Cincinnati, in their tech program. I believe that was 75. I got a degree from them in 78. I left Cincinnati. Um, uh, I did not go to graduate school. I got accepted to Yale, but we had to turn them down they didn't give me enough money and I was getting married. I'm not going to say which was a better idea, but we'll let, um, is, is Kate, home? Up, what? What? Is Kate uh, home? I'll let you know if I have to duck. Yeah. Okay. Um, in what was it? 81. I moved to New York 80 or 81. I moved to New York and right into the lighting tech lighting slash designer. One of the guys at the Savoy, which started all of the real, I mean, my real theatrical work started at the conservatory. We did really good stuff. Um, the tech program was uh, number one in the country for a number of years, but I got to the Savoy and that's when I was introduced to the rest of the world. Um, we stayed there for three or four years. I picked up several tours, went out as a rigger, rock and roll style. I was already Ooh. married and had a kid, which made it tough, got off the road, um, at least that way, and then took over. Hi, John and Susan. I took over Judy Collins as a road manager somewhere in the like 86 or 85 or 86 uh, time period and did that for about five or six years. And John is still snickering about that one, I think. Who is? John. <laughs> well, he dodged a bullet, but that... <laughs> There's a story. You want to hear that story? We, yeah. we didn't come, Michael, they didn't come here to listen to us not tell stories. <laughs> when, when John introduced me to Judy in Cincinnati, and John, let's just say John and Judy weren't the best of friends. And when I took over, we had a meeting in Judy's apartment on, uh, on the Upper West Side. I really didn't know what I was walking into. But I went into the apartment, John was there, we talked, we went over some things, this and that. And at the end of the 20 minutes or whatever it was, Judy turned to John and said, you know how to get out, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I went, oh my God, what have I gotten myself into? Um, 
we're going to not go into any more of the it, it worked out with Judy. I did Judy Collins for about five or six years. Um, and, the, and during that time, I moved back to Philadelphia and I was sharing time between Sapsis Rigging and Judy. And um, by 90, I guess it was 90, 91, I was probably, is that when I was probably full time at the, uh, at the company, Bill? Yeah, pretty somewhere thereabouts, yeah. Somewhere thereabouts. So that's it in a nutshell. I mean, if you want to know something in between any of that, I'll answer it. But you know. I got to tell one. I got to tell one Judy Collins story that I've always liked. And John, you were there, so you know. Um, we were Judy was playing the uh, Valley Forge Music Fair, and um, so I went up, you know, to see the show and hang out. John Hickey, I think you were there. I, you, you correct me if I'm wrong, because we were playing um, Asteroids, I think, at that time. And, uh, and Michael was there and we went out to dinner afterwards and it was a group of us and Judy and her at the time boyfriend, her partner, whose name I forget. Lewis Nelson. Lewis Nelson, right. So we're Lord. having dinner, it's at the Hilton or whatever the hotel was in their restaurant. And um, I remarked that I kind of liked the wine glasses that, uh, that they were using. And you know, that's, that's ah, nice wine glasses. So we finished dinner and we all kind of got up and walked out pretty much the same. They got to the door and both Judy and Lewis pulled a wine glass out of inside their coat and handed it to me. <laughs> I thought, hey. I, don't laugh, Laurie. I think you may have drunk out of those recently. I'm not sure. <laughs> Eddie, I want to I want to take this I want to take this back a little bit because I want people to know that Michael is actually the person who's responsible for me getting into the rigging business. I don't know if he remembers this story or not, but Michael was in, in, in Cincinnati and I would go out, I'd hitchhike out to, to since from Philadelphia to Cincinnati every once in a while. You and flew once and, and, and we, you flew once and I wrecked my motorcycle. Well, yeah, that's another story. I'll come back to that one in a second. Um, but um, you were doing some work for Beck Studios. You had gotten like a summer job or something with them. I don't remember exactly, but you were doing an install in Terre Haute, Indiana, in Jasper. high school, you know, counterweight rigging install. And you, you called me up and said, come on out, you make some money, you know? What did I know from really, a, you know, a counterweight system at this stage of the game, other than what I had seen at Temple University? And um, so I went out there and, you know, did an install with them, you know, I don't know, a week or two. Um, but the important part of this story and the one that stuck with me forever was this was the first time that in our adult lives that Michael ever threw anything at me. Uh, and, really? and he threw an oak desk, you know, <laughs> the big teacher oak desk. He threw one of those at me. And, um, you know, really? we were off and running from there. <laughs> Yeah, you, you, the throwing of things at each other is infamous. It's I've heard stories third hand from so many people about different objects being thrown. Did uh, I call it? I don't I think. No, you didn't. We didn't know to call it until later. You didn't right. call. The, you were you were too busy trying to pick the damn thing up. I is what you were doing. Was Ozzy there? Yes. Okay. See, I remember some things. Yeah. There you go. So um, I'm going to back up just a little bit more too. Um, I know, Bill, you, you had a couple of stories about what it was that convinced you you wanted to be in uh, the live yeah. theater. One of them was a rehe dance rehearsal in a lecture hall or something like that. Uh, you, you mixed, you, you just combined the two stories. Okay, go ahead. Um, the first one was, uh, I did a production of Peter Pan uh, it was my very first production. It was you know, a, a local production. It was actually my, my girlfriend at the time put it together. She was Peter. And we were in a lecture hall at the University of Pennsylvania. And, you know, we had, well, we had no money and we had no space. I mean, we're, it was a lecture hall. And the, the, the targeted audience was under 10 years old, you know, eight, nine, 10 year old kids. And I'm not sure where she got, you know, how she marketed. I didn't get involved in that part. So I did the set and the set basically, we, I mean, we had no room, we had no, no money. So I managed to get some scaffolding from Penn 
uh, from the from the theater, and I put a couple of towers over at um, in the theater, and um, ran some pipe across. And for the flying effects, I mean these things were you know nine feet high or you know ten feet high, something like that. For the flying effects, I hung rope from the pipes, and they had a, a foot loop in them. So if you were going to fly, you put your foot in the loop and you swung. For Peter, we put a tire in it, you know, so it, so Peter ha had a, a tire swing and that was the flying effect. You know, at the pirate, you know, in the pirate's cove, when they're on the ship and we went did water, we just had the blue fabric that a couple of kids waved in front of it and stuff. And they ate it up. The audience ate it up. We were supposed to do it for two, two weekends. We did it for five. They just kept coming. And I looked at that and went, oh, wow. This is really cool. Prior to that, and John Hickey, I'm, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you were involved in this one. Um, I had just started working at Penn, and it was coming up on the uh, on the Christmas season, kind of right, right, like right around now. And all the local dance companies, you know, they would do their recitals and stuff, and bring the parents in, and all that. And I was the low guy on the totem pole, so I got tapped to stage manage those things right and we were doing one one day john was if i'm correct me if i'm wrong john but i'm pretty sure you were on follow spot and i was calling the show and it was you know this endless stream of you know, little kids doing doing their dances and stuff and then we got into the older kids and then we finally got into the kids who were you know late teens and they did a duet to uh, tchaikovsky's romeo and juliet which i did not know at the time, I didn't know the music. Um, but we, you know, I, we, you know I, I called the show and they're, you know, they're dancing. And then as they started to get into the end, the way that, that the music fades out, I realized something, I could do something. And we started, I started taking the lights out and I brought John's follow spot up so that they were just in the follow spot. And then as the music and they, both they stopped dancing at the same time. We just slowly irised into their head and then irised out. And then we went to blackout. The audience was full of parents. I mean, there was 600, 700 people in, in the house. They went crazy, you know, yelling, screaming and hollering. And I went, oh, this is cool. <laughs> I like this. Nice. And, you know, those were, you know, the two moments. I mean, there's a lot of other moments that I had. Um, but those were the two that really stand out for me that just said, you know, you have the ability working in this environment to make these people really, really happy. Cool. So Mike, how did you get into, how did you get into theater? I mean, you, you, you obviously did a lot of it when you were growing up. So how did you get, those? what brought you into it? I went to university on engineering that failed. I moved over to the conservatory because on advice of some people after I, they knew what I could do as a carpenter. The very first show that we did at the conservatory was Wizard of Oz. It had a 6,000 pound flying set. The entire Oz flew in, you know, Kansas was a rake stage, bare, you know, nice and flat off into the distance. Um, Oz flew down. All the beds flew, the monkeys flew. It was one of those technologically marvelous shows. And I'm the new kid on the block. I'd never done anything, let alone anything like that. We had a blast. When we flew the, and Bill was in the audience one night, we flew the, you know, we fly the, uh, it was a double spiral helix made out of pipe. You fly that thing in, people in the first couple rows of the audience, you could see them wanting to back up because it was right in front of them. They had no idea what was going on. And they'd never seen anything like that. That's what started it, okay? And because I was at the conservatory, it never stopped there. While I was at the conservatory to pay for stuff, I was taking calls uh, with Local 5 around town. And, you know, we were, and I was not shy about anything. And I got myself on regular- Really? <laughs> What what do you say? I said. I think you guys share that trait between you. <laughs> really. 
the not shy part. Yeah. Yeah. I'm shy. Yeah. Um, I can't anyway, even. That's how, and, and I walked into it in one day and that was it. Wow. You know, and I don't think I have as many of the lofty ideas as to what it was going to do for me or how I was going to proceed in it as Bill did. I was probably chasing a girl. <laughs> And you caught one, right? Yeah. <laughs> your wife, Michael, your wife. Okay. Just go with that, all right? Okay. <laughs> yeah, she knows. Anyway, what's next? Um, summer stock in Philly. <laughs> I understand Michael was the uh, master carpenter and Bill was working for you. I was the projectionist. No, no, wait. What's, no, the propulsionist. I was the guy that was in charge of throwing things through doors at Bill. Right. Yeah. <laughs> now, so it's, it's one famous, you know, I'm sure Bill remembers it, you know, hammer? Wiley Coyote kind of thing. I threw a hammer at him and it went through a screen door. He was on the other side of the screen door and it left the silhouette of the hammer as it went through the screen door. Right. It was perfect. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was it was it was summer stock and, um, uh, you know, in the round Philadelphia Playhouse in the park, you know, the shop are in, you know, these kind of barn structures across the driveway from the theater, you know, and it's, it's everything you would imagine for a mid 70s summer stock facility. And, uh, and yeah, Michael spent most of his time throwing things at me and when he wasn't doing that he was building a treehouse he was going to live in. Did that ever happen? I don't remember. I spent uh, about four nights in it and then discovered that every insect in the entire forest had discovered my treehouse and we right. didn't stay, we right. didn't cohabitate anymore. No. Yeah, the playhouse in the park is in the middle of Fairmount Park. It's a big city park. Um, uh, that's yeah. where I got, if, if I may, Eddie, that's where I got to work with Peter Foy the very first time he, oh. um, he came in and uh, did a, a, a Peter Pan. So this was my first professional Peter Pan. Um, uh, Peter was, was played by Tova Feldshu, if anybody remo remembers Tova. Um, she's still around, uh, but yeah, you know, I was 75 and you know, she was my heartthrob. Um, you remember Margaret Hamilton? Huh? I'll go to the Margaret Hamilton in a second, but um, Tova, <laughs> Tova came in and she did Peter Pan and we were right it's in the round so you know you got to worry about the audience being able to see everything and you can't build scenery too tall and all that and um, Milton Moss was the producer and Peter both of them having enormous personalities and Milton always worried about making sure the audience would be able to see um, he had us keep, he kept getting us, you know, cut this, cut that prop down or cut that wall down, make it shorter. And it kept throwing off Peter's trim marks. And he, I'm told, I, I found out later, it's one of the very few times where Peter completely lost his temper, literally screaming bloody murder at Milton. I thought he was going to go after him. But I realized that, you know, I could help the situation out. So thereafter, whenever Milton turned to us and said, you know, cut that down. They said, I remember one time he said, cut the doghouse down three inches. So, okay. So we, we took it, the doghouse out into the alley where the, the sort of kind of shop was. And somebody stood there with a, a skill saw on a two by four. And they cut the two by four a couple of times. And we brought the doghouse back in. And Milton went, perfect. <laughs> okay. I have to admit that I've actually done things like that myself in theater, you know, Tr trim that leg and you slap the line set and it shakes and they, oh, that's good right there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so how did Sapsis rigging come about? I mean, you guys were building scenery before you're actually doing rigging, right? Well, we, we okay. actually, not quite, but very, very close. Um, I moved out of New York City in 76. Um, just got tired of living in New York City, was not my thing. Moved back to Philadelphia and took a bunch of odd jobs, mostly in the theater, some not. I had a furniture business for a while. I was building custom furniture till they 
they, they somebody burglarized the place and took everything. Um, and then I realized that, you know, I couldn't keep doing that. So I wanted to stay in theater and was looking for some, some way to do that. And I thought that eh, I like the rigging stuff. Uh, I, you know, I had gotten Michael's uh, introduction to it and uh, had done a couple of other jobs for Clancy at the time. So I started doing rigging. It, it wasn't a real planned thing, um, but I started the company in 81 and our first big job was at Bryn Mawr College. And correct me if I'm wrong, Michael, but a couple of days after we started the job, I moved to Taiwan for about six months. Yeah. <laughs> How nice of you. I, I'm bringing up a painful subject. Is that what I'm doing? Bryn Mawr was drilling the first concrete arch poured in the country. It was poured in 1928. Tons of stone, an impossible... And, and, and back then we're using hammer drills like Milwaukee hammer drills. Hilti didn't exist. If it did, we didn't know about it. Um, long story short, we drilled, I think it was somewhere between 90 and 110 holes in this arch to put this curtain up. We used somewhere between 90 and 110 drill bits. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> the curtain was a double-sided curtain fit into the arch designed to separate the stage from the audience so that they could do classes on stage and then have something on the other side of the curtain. The place looked like a church and it was designed as a theater. I know that's the way it doesn't usually go, but that's the way it went. Um, the curtain was at the peak 57 feet high and 90 feet, maybe 100, 90, 110 feet wide, double sided. We got it from Rosebrand we had ordered 20, 28 inch, 20, uh, 28 ounce, 20, 25 ounce, something in that range, soft goods, velours. Um, back in those days, it was strictly cotton velour. They didn't tell us that they upped the ante to something like 37 or 38 oh, uh, yeah. ounces per yard. They, they made it incredibly heavier. And we had to get this thing up with no overhead mechanical advantage. Um, which is why I stayed in Taiwan. He was pumped. Oh. He was pumped. And it meant the seats were still in the in the in the building. The scaffolding, which was 57 feet high, had to roll on a raked audience so that we could put up one side of the curtain and then move the scaffolding and put up the other side of the curtain. And of course, it's when the first time we put the curtains up, they didn't fit. They had to be taken down and shipped back. They were so wrong that they were shipped back to Rosebrand and then re-sewn, you know. So in all, I think the entire set of curtains got um, re-hung three times. We finally were happy with everything that we were doing. We took down the scaffolding, got the scaffolding out of the way. Um, and then after a week of testing, we discovered that the curtains would not close because they were rubbing on themselves up at the peak of the arch, 57 feet in the air. We no longer had scaffolding in. Do you remember this? Oh, yeah. I came um, back for this one. Say what? I yeah, came you came back, back for this, this one. one. Let's just say um, the safety issues that you guys bring up today were not employed. Um, we, we, to make a long story short, we threw a ball through a hole in the arch at the top. There was a little decorative hole in the thing. We threw that with a piece of fishing line on it, pulled the rope, pulled the bigger rope, pulled the other rope, pulled the block and fall up and tied it off. And then I went up in a block and fall, 57 feet, pulling myself up and had to rearrange the curtains and then sew them, re-sew them so that they pulled away from each other so the damn thing would finally close. Um, and only to get up to the top of it and to see that the line that we had pulled through had worn itself on the crack of the concrete. There's a center crack. And one strand of the three-stranded hemp that we were using wasn't there anymore. 
Well, I made short work of it, and I said, I'm coming down now. We're not coming back up. <laughs> I'd, like to, I'd like to point out of this juncture that he continued to work for me after this event. <laughs> so, Bill, I've heard about this infamous Taiwan trip before. What were you doing in Taiwan? Uh, I built a theater for the Taipei city government in, um, in, in Taipei on uh, Badarlu, Bader Street. Um, it was a Kliegel Clancy, you know, get together. One that happened once and once only. And um, it was a, a, a double purchase house with about 75 counterweight sets. I did that. There was a, a acoustical ceiling out in the house that was a decorative ceiling that was also supposed to be acoustical uh, in nature. Um, I installed the lighting system and the sound system. And to top it off, there was a 50,000 pound rolling scaffolding uh, where, excuse me, rolling uh, orchestra shell. I don't know where scaffolding came from, but uh, rolling orchestra shell um, uh, that stored in an upstage scene dock and then rolled down onto stage. It was fun. It, I was there off and on. I was supposed to, Jack Cease, this guy who hired me, he said, um, so yeah, it's about a three month job. The first trip was six months and the second two trips were two months each. So it was a little longer than that. Wow. Yeah. So, um, I had a, you guys had a number of questions from people who want to know um, when you started sepsis rigging, um, what'd you get right and what'd you get wrong? What did, what did you learn 30 years later that you got right and got wrong that you would have done differently had you known better? <laughs> you mean like not start the company? Well, there's that. Yeah. <laughs> Bill, you're on your own on this one. I don't show up for another 15 years. Ah, okay. Uh, I mean, it felt at the time that we were doing a lot of things right because we were busy as hell. Um, but as with any, well, as with most, I guess, startup companies, you know, money was always tight. Um, Sarah Gallen, who's here somewhere, um, had, had come in and, and started working with us. Um, personal stuff came later a little bit, but, um, you know, we were always, you know, I, I wasn't getting paid half the time and all that. I think the thing that I would have gone back and changed is I would have paid attention to um, the marketing side a little bit more, you know we were getting a lot of work and we were always busy. Um, my, 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 my reframe, somebody would, you know, jokingly say, um, what do you want to be when you grow up, Bill? And I would say not tired. Um, <laughs> that hasn't happened yet, but um, you know, so we were always working and there was not as much time to pay attention until the nineties to pay attention to the, the administrative marketing advertising side of things. Interesting. Does okay. that answer it? Yeah, no, that, that kind of gets it. Mike, when did you start at Sapsis Rigging? I moved back to Philadelphia in 86 when Paul was born. Um, I was sharing time between, sharing time between, um, I, uh, prior to the 86, I was living in New York City. 86 on is when I was here. I was sharing time between the company and Judy Collins until let's call it 90, 91, 92, something like that. Um, and, but my full time probably is 88, 89, something like that was my full time work at the company. If I had known then. Did you, when you were, you also road managed uh, Grace Jones for a while, didn't you? No, um, it wasn't Nona Hendricks and I was a lighting right. designer. Nona, Nona Hendricks, that's right. Yeah. When I was at the Savoy, I, was, I did an awful lot of lighting design, which many people probably will laugh at, but I got real good at, at uh, lighting a lot of fairly famous people who didn't bring LDs. And if you remember, the, the Savoy was where we did the first MTV New Year's Eve shows. 
uh, of an enormous amount of um, Simon and Garfunkel reunion shows. Um, people like that. The Savoy was a pretty hot place for three whole years. We we ha we had done. I we uh, Saps's ring had been hired to do the renovation of the Savoy, taking the building which had been uh, empty for since the mid '60s, um, taking it and converting it from the Broadway house that it was into a music venue. Uh, Ron Delsner was a producer at the time, and um, you know, so we did that, and then when um you know when when we were done the renovation we kind of shifted over to being the house staff you know we were with we were the crew i was i was i was the flyman michael was the ld along and you know there were a couple of other people in hop a, a couple of other there. people was hickey, was hickey there too hickey was in and out john got me the job there you're remembering this a little differently and i'm not going to get into it too heavily okay but the other people that were at the Savoy, um, people people that you know, many of us know, Michael Callahan, Bob Goddard, John Ackerman, Ron Rob, Ron Lorman, all these were, you know, you know they were lions in, in the uh, in the industry back in those days, the the trusses that Michael Callahan and probably Goddard designed started in 81 they finally got rid of them about four years ago when the place finally went back to a broadway house and they were so far ahead of their time we had the first high density dimmer racks anywhere lmi 96 racks lmis mm. yeah but you know they were the first ones ever okay first you know you remember the board anyway i digress there were some really good people there i was the odd man out right <laughs> As was I. So I know you guys have done some pretty amazing uh, projects over the years. Um, a couple of them that you guys pointed out were uh, removing an old wooden grid from Lakewood, New Jersey. <laughs> oh my God. I brought it up, Michael. I had to do it. I had to do it. You know, well, it doesn't translate very well. Huh? How how well does it that the stories from that thing translate to a forum like this? Who cares? I'm going to tell it anyway. <laughs> so we got hired. We there are two things, two two quick stories to this one. We got hired to remove a wooden grid from a, a theater in Lakewood, New Jersey. You know, an old local kind of vaudeville type house, not terribly large, if I remember correctly. Um, the grid had burned and they were going to replace it with a steel grid, but they needed somebody to get the old one out first. So the only access to the grid was to go up an outside ladder up onto the roof. And then we tossed a rope down through the smoke door and climbed down the rope. Right? Yeah. So it's about 15 feet down the rope. And then at the end of the day, climb back up. So we're in there. And we're cutting, it's a wooden grid. We're cutting it up with chainsaws, tying it off. You know, the, the beams as we cut through them are swinging across the stage back and forth. And we let them settle down and we bring them down to the floor. Well, you didn't tell them the reason for that. There was no overhead rigging. No, we, the, yeah. A lousy piece of quarter inch cable, wall to wall. <laughs> that we right. are. Even if it wasn't lousy, it wasn't enough. So we're taking this stuff down. And it takes a few days and climbing down and climbing up was an exercise in just abject fear. Uh, we get the stuff down on the on the floor and on, on the stage and we're going to take it out. There's a big dumpster out on the street and get to the dumpster. Um, it was a tall dumpster. And when you came out the side of the stage, I think it was the stage, um, there's a, you know, 15, 16 steps down to the street. So we just planked over. So you could walk straight across from the stage over to the dumpster. You got a big beam over your shoulder. You get to the dumpster, you pitch it in. So Michael picks up a beam that's probably, you know, bigger than he should have. Now there's a surprise. And he walks out there and he pitches this beam into the dumpster. The dumpster was empty. And it just brought us a new one. It was empty. So it goes in end first and hits on the floor of the dumpster and bounces straight up. 
and it comes straight up. Now, as the as the beam is going straight up, there's a Volkswagen at the corner, making the corner with this little old guy, two hands on the wheel, driving down the street. And he's doing about, you know, three feet every couple of days. He's driving down. He's going down. The beam is making its arc coming out of the dumpster heading for the street where the Volkswagen is. And literally the guy, I mean, he never saw the beam and I don't think he knew about it even after it hit the ground about six inches behind his back bumper. But I thought this guy's dead, you know, cause it was, you know, it's about a 10 foot long, you know, eight by 12 beam or something. Oh, they were 12 by, they were 12 by 14. It was big, it was heavy. We did stupid stuff. Well, Lakewood has uh, a, a uh, history of doing stupid stuff. Just for as a sidebar, I don't know if you guys remember that Bob Dylan got arrested for a vagrancy in Jersey two or three years ago because he was walking around town before his show, and the cops picked him up. And it was in Lakewood, and they were playing <laughs> at that theater. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. And the cops had the cop had picked him up. He went, he said, but I'm Bob Dylan. And the cop went, who? <laughs> well, the cop was like 14 uh, years old. Yeah. yeah. So at what point in the genesis of sepsis rigging did the palladium happen? <laughs> palladium happened in 1985. Okay. I had, um, it was, I had, just finished a project. I just finished the Marriott Marquis in Times Square for Clancy. Now Clancy had just re recently been purchased by this guy, Bob Tice. And um, Bob was not of the industry. Um, and so, and he was trying to learn as quickly as he could. And somehow he got, got a hold of my name and he hired me to run the installation of the rigging system at the Marriott Marquis in the, the Marquis, in the Marriott Hotel on Times Square there. And, um, after I finished that, then the Palladium job came up and he tapped me to, um, to do that one again uh, for, for Clancy. They did, they built um, sort of, they built the, uh, <laughs> uh, the rigging, the rigging for, for that club, which was back in the day, pretty innovative and pretty intense. I heard that or should I? Lots of stories about the, this installation. Um, I think one of the things most notably is that you had a number of women on your crew on the rigging. Yeah. Crew, which was not normal for those days. I mean, you know, there just weren't any women doing rigging in, in, in the 80s. So I thought that was pretty progressive. There weren't any twins either. No, there weren't any twins either. <laughs> a lot of twins. Um, yeah, we had... Um, you have a video of this, right? I have a video of one quick bit now i'm going to share i'm going to do this Before you share the video i want to disclaimer here this i am not advocating this kind of behavior on jobs going forward okay just um to say that hang on a second here i gotta figure out my screen <sighs> where there it is you need to set uh set the stage here bill or I will. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Bill is is sitting on top of a inverted U-shaped device, which is the yoke for a 25 monitor video wall. This is the first moving video wall ever anywhere. And since it's 85, you have to remember it's glass. It's you know tubes. It they're, they're studio monitors. Um, I forget the. The model that we used it was out of Florida, um, but there were 25 of them. The yoke that Bill is sitting on enables the uh, device to spin helic to helicopter, spin uh, in, uh, around, and also on the arms coming down where those guys are standing is another pivot device so that the video wall itself can spin inside. Think of Tron and the uh, flying bridge things or whatever those things were. He's sitting on the uh, insert that will go into a tripod, which you're gonna see, well, you won't see it, but I'm on top of it. Um, 
that is the lifting device so that the whole the whole thing could fly up and down it could spin horizontally and then the uh monitors themselves encased could roll over to 180 degrees flat to the floor um and we had to put them together and we didn't have as much equipment as then as we do now yeah go ahead bill and you're sitting on a three-legged stool on top of the beam it looks like me or this bill oh. No. no, that is the insert that goes up into the. That's a that's a, a, a the connector. Oh, I see. Up into the um, the the flying the uh, bracket. The okay. it's it, it's it's a tripod. It's a lifting device. Right. Okay. Oh my God! That's my. Don't and, do this at home, kids. Yeah, don't do this at home. And why is Michael standing on top of the motor? As as best as we can remember, they weren't our. There wasn't our motors. Um, That's the first thing. And we had no pickle extension. And I think we found out that we didn't have a pickle extension when we needed the pickle extension, as in right now. Right. So we either were, you know, somebody was going to go out and buy plugs and make something there was nothing in the house for some reason that we could you know and the long story short was the, the motor needed to go up and so i went up with it <laughs> and it back in those days it wasn't something that was completely unheard of at all right now we all did a lot of really stupid things back those days that we wouldn't do nowadays oh i don't know talk about it oh i'd Go still fly on it Going going back to the uh, to the women on the crew, I think that it's an important point to make that there, you know, in general, it somehow feels like we were a little more enlightened back in those days than we are now, at least in certain areas, in certain environments, because there were a half a dozen women on that crew, um, and once the Palladium finished, I took that group of people and started doing. Um, uh, the installation of the rigging systems over in Theater Row on 42nd Street. And it was an all woman crew. I walked in the first day, handed them the drawings and, you know, gave them, you know, showed them where to, how to um, uh, orient themselves in the room. And I left and um, came back when the job was done. You know. That was, that was a reoccurring theme. Yes. Bill's leaving when the job starts. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Another reoccurring theme is whenever Bill says I, and you know, many often it was not just I, it was we, but I, 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 I'm not, I'm not jaded or anything. No. <laughs> well, you're usually the one that was left there to do it. So, um, uh, yeah. So, uh, you had a thing there at the time that George Jacobson, president of Rosebrand, bailed you out of a jam with Calvin Klein at four o'clock in the morning. Yeah, this is a shout out to uh, to George. Um, I was Calvin Klein's technical director for about four years, um, which is a story unto itself, which we're not going to get into in any detail today. Um, but the way it worked back in those days is he did his shows in his showroom on the ninth floor, eighth or ninth floor of his building on 39 West 39th Street. And we would, it's a showroom. So on Friday, we would tear out the showroom. Saturday and Sunday, we would build the, um, uh, the, the fashion show. And then Monday morning at 930 on the dot, uh, they would do the fashion show. He was really meticulous that way. And we had been going on and doing this for, you know, probably a year or so. And um, so one, you know, one weekend I'm in New York um, doing, uh, doing the show. And then Sunday we finish up, I go back to Philadelphia. Uh, Sarah and I were married at the time. And um, about, I don't know, maybe it was around 10 or 11 o'clock at night. You got the call, Sarah. I mean, you answered the phone. And I remember that he, he it, she looked at me and said, it's Calvin Klein. And I'm thinking, well, this isn't going to be good. There's no reason for him calling me at 10 or 11 o'clock on a Sunday night to say hello. Uh, and he wanted to change the color of the set. Now, the color that he always used, what they called taupe, 
It was, you know, baby shit brown as far as I was concerned. Um, but that was their color all the time. And that's what the color of this set was. And he had decided that he wanted it to be black. I said, okay. So I got off the phone. And this is, you know, this is going back a ways. Rosebram was still in their facility on West 35th Street in, in Manhattan. And I had George's home phone number and I used it. Called him up, told him what the story was. George drove into the city, opened up the shop for me. I went upstairs and got as many bolts of black fabric as I could. It was on the fifth of the sixth floor. It's 4 a.m. The freight elevator isn't working yet because they're not going to run that freight elevator elevator until the freight elevator operator shows up at 8 a.m., which is not going to work for me. You know, so here I am pitching but bales of uh, bolts of uh, black fabric down the steps, down the steps, down the steps. Um, the guys, I had already called the guys. Uh, we went up 15 minutes late. It never would have happened if George had said, what are you, crazy? Uh, he came over and opened up for me. And, you know, he's still a nice guy. Nice, nice. There's so many stories from our industry like that where people just, I recognize that you know we can make we can make a difference here we can make the show happen right or and do it so that's kind of cool um okay so you guys did a lot of work at the white house apparently <laughs> um, in, including intentionally breaking a trust which i'm not sure it was about to, what, what was that like working in the white house mike i'll start this one because you hate me about this job right well you i was always the red-haired stepchild yeah you guys went and did the the glory. You guys put the thing in. You hung out. You 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 know got all your pictures taken. And then me, Paul, young Billy, Scott. I don't remember if you were Scott England. Were you involved in these? I can't remember. But you know we we I took never, it down. Yeah, I never got on a White House gig. I was always somewhere else. Lucky you. Yeah. But I was always the guy who went down to take it down. Uh, on New, Year New Year's Eve. They wanted it down um, bef before New Year's Day because there was something else going on. Right. Anyway, go ahead and tell the stories. Yeah. I'll sit here in the dark. Okay. No problem. So we get hired, hired. We didn't get paid. We don't get paid for this. We volunteered. Uh, Robert Isabel was hired. The designer was hired to do the Christmas decorations, the holiday, excuse me, holiday decorations at the White House. And part of that, the first year, was to hang a large mm -hmm. foot diameter advent wreath in hey. one of the state room. It was the East Room, I think. Mike, do you remember? Well, the, 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 the two wreaths that we hung and the chandeliers. We had to replace the chandeliers. What? Just tell me the name of the room. The East, the East Dining Room. Okay. The State Dining Room, OK? Yeah. Tell them what year my, tell I'm them, finish my story and then you can finish your story. Why don't you tell them what year it was so that they have some kind of time reference? I don't remember what year. It was during the Clinton administration. I don't remember what That'll year. That'll do it. it. All right, so it was during the Clinton administration. First, when we got asked to do this and we were told that it had the, the, the advent wreath in the East Room with the chandeliers that we took down, uh, we also had a 20, they had this large wreath that they wanted to hang on the Truman balcony, on the pillars of the Truman balcony, which is the one that faces the South Lawn. So in my conversations with Robert Isabel's people, I told them what needed to happen because they said they would provide or the, the park service, somebody was going to provide the structure. So I said, it's gotta be a trust and a circle trust. No big deal, right? So they, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we get down there on the, on the appointed day and I look at this thing and it is a circle, but it is not trust. It is this homemade piece of crap. And I'm looking at it thinking, how do I get this thing up in the air without breaking it? And then I'm thinking, why would I do that? So I tried to talk the park service who they handle the, 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 the grounds there. I tried to talk them into not using that and letting me get something else, but it was gonna delay the job and they didn't wanna hear about that. So they made me use it. Now you gotta use, gotta use it. So it was in, the piece was in three segments. It was about 20 feet, 22 feet in diameter. Um, it was in three segments 
So instead of taking the, 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 the joint and putting it somewhere, you know, off, to, off of midnight, you know, off at, tw off at 12 o'clock, I put it right at 12 o'clock. And then I picked it up. We had a crane, you know, 50 ton crane. And I picked up the, uh, the wreath, but I picked it up right next to, to, to 12 o'clock. I picked it up at 11.59 and 12.01. So the, the swings were right. This, this, the structure never had a chance. It never got off the ground. We managed to get it stood up and you could hear the welds breaking as it was going up. I mean, they're just snapping all the way around. And, you know, it went immediately, it went pear-shaped. And I went, I turned to the, to the, to the uh, park service guy and went, see, I told you. Um, and that, so we brought it back down and we did a mad scramble calling around the country, trying to find somebody with a 20 to 22 foot diameter truss ring like you would normally use found one of those got that in there in a day maybe a day and a half or something we were in town we had nothing to do so we were on the white house grounds and they gave us tours of everything so we had we did have a good time and unfortunately michael never got a shot at doing that and i apologize now officially okay michael. okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> But that's the first time I've ever deliberately, and only time I've ever de deliberately broken something. Yeah, there's a little more to some of these stories, but the, yeah, and I'm not going to go into there. We used to put Paul up. Paul was like 11 years old. And we put him up. There was a, a the 50 ton crane plus a snorkel lift, 65 foot snorkel lift that you had to go up and set the span sets and things on the columns. Um, we used to send Paul up with young Billy to take him, take him apart. We sent Paul up with a camera because at the time the Washington Monument was in scaffolding. They were repairing it. And when you get up at that balcony, when you take a picture from there, it's obvious you're taking it from the balcony because there's no other place you can get that shot. And of course, we told Paul to take a couple of shots, but then he started taking pictures inside the residence. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And it was like, okay, you have to stop. <laughs> yeah. so this was obviously prior 911 because everybody thought thing, this was a game and it certainly wouldn't have been after 911. Right. Uh, so Paul got his start pretty early in, in the business. <laughs> Paul uh, got yeah. his start at around 11 years old going on the jobs with me. Yeah. And everybody in New York especially when we were doing the fashion shows and Paul was showing up at all this stuff. Bill came into a, a show we were doing in the Celeste Bartos forum. Paul was inside. He had crawled inside a 20 inch truss that we had up on a self climber. He was crawling down the inside of the truss. Bill walked in and said, what's Paul doing up there? And three electricians without missing a beat turned around and went focusing. <laughs> And that's a yeah, and that was the you know yeah. Paul followed in my footsteps and then outpaced me very quickly. And Jessica was doing that too. One of the things to remember about my relationship with Michael is that you know on a job site we never got along, and you know at some point we decided or it was decided for us by our clients that the two of us weren't allowed on the same job at the same time, um, and it, typically it didn't happen. Um, Paul and Michael developed a very similar relationship early on, as you can imagine, with a teenager and, and his father. Um, yeah. And I started hearing, I started hearing about um, their discussions and their arguments on site from my clients. So, you know, it became one of those, well, you know, maybe we shouldn't put the two of you on the same job site. And then there came the time it was in the, I believe it was at a downtown armory, the 26th street armory, where I showed up for reasons that I don't remember and had to stay there. Michael was running the job and Paul was on the job. He was, he was, um, he, wow. he, he, he was head rigger, I believe. He was climbing. Yeah. Yeah. He was climbing. And um, so all three of us were on the same job and, and, you know, the world didn't end fortunately. Sure. It wasn't a convergence on the timeline of, of space. No. The continuum. no. Yeah. Okay. Good. Space time continuum is what you're looking for. Yes. Um, so one of the, one of your 
more spectacular jobs that I know of is is the Phoenix in St. John's. And um, I've heard stories. I want to hear Mike's version of this because I've never heard Mike tell the story before, but going up into the ceiling and spotting the points and figuring out where exactly those things were going to end up because it just sounded <laughs> kind of iffy uh, given the structure of the building. But um, you have pictures, I take it. Bill's going to show you pictures. Um, Tell us the story. Well, the Phoenix, for those that, it, it was in St. John's, set the stage a little bit. St. John's Cathedral, largest Gothic cathedral in the United States, possibly the world, depending on how you measure it. 125 feet in the nave where this thing hung. It's 125 feet to the center of the nave. And... Um, uh, it's 60 feet across in between the columns. Each of the, there were two uh, dragons, two, two flying phoenix. They each weighed about 13,000 pounds a piece. And we put up a flying grid, which weighed about 14,000 pounds. Now, all of this is underneath a, uh, a, a the, the nave ceiling, which is made of entirely of stone and uh, terracotta tile. The arches and all the support op supports are obviously um, granite, stone, and doing their job. And the rest of it is really, and I can't remember which uh, style of tile it is just because I can't remember and I apologize. But it's, you know, you can walk on it, but none of it's load bearing. On top of all this, and remember this is a masonry structure, but on top of this is another 50, 50 to 60 feet of steel, which is supporting the roof. And that's its main job, um, supporting the roof and trying to hold the two sides of the building together. In the ceiling of the, in the nave, um, there are old chandelier holes and breather holes, which allow access from, you know, where you're standing, where you're looking right now at these pictures, through the, the, the ceiling into the uh, attic above where the steel is. The, Phoenix is a Chinese sculpture, which we got a lot of actually very good information as to where all the rigging points were. And there was about 75 or 80 rigging points that connected the, the sculpture to whatever it is you were hanging it from. It is hung from a variety of different sculpture structures. Mass Mocha was one of them, that sort of thing. Um, we had to translate all of those rigging points into the rigging points that lined up with the holes in the ceiling. And we certainly weren't drilling any new holes. To add, you know, to add to the problem, the holes in the ceiling didn't line up to anything either. So any, um, any holes in the ceiling above them was a bridle between two pieces of steel uh, that were at least 30 feet apart and bridles were fairly shallow. Uh, we rarely got to, you know, 90 degrees, but we never got to 90 degrees. Um, but the long story short, there was an awful lot of coordination between the engineering for the Phoenix as it related to the truss structure, and then the truss structure as it related to the building structure. I am, I am feverishly trying to find those photographs. You just had two photographs up. I'm talking about the attic. Oh, okay. I didn't know you had them. All right. I don't know that I do either, but I'm looking. We'll have a good time. Um, <laughs> the run up to the, uh, for the engine, the engineering was done for that, for the cathedral had their own in-house engineers. Um, hey, Michael. Yeah. Before you go too far. Yeah, I know. With this conversation, don't go too far. Yeah. Um, the, it was a challenge. There was a, a communication issue. There was um, procedural issues. We had been rigging in the attic of the cathedral for 15 years. I've been up until before this, I've been in the cathedral since 1988, uh, rigging shows, putting up bridles, doing any number of things. The engineering was based on engineering that we had done in 88, 89, and 90 with a guy, John Watson, I believe his name was, who was master of the works, 
because the cathedral was still being built at that time. It's no longer, of course. Um, no engineering had been done since then. And of course, there was no, there was no paper trail whatsoever. So we didn't know, long story short, we didn't know what our lateral um, uh, forces, we knew what the lateral forces we were going to be on the horizontal beams. We didn't know where the horizontal beams would take it. Uh, I can't go into a long, long uh, story about it, but ultimately, yeah, okay. Well, and look, there's the picture, and you can see, you can see how flat the the bridles are. Yeah. Our main concern was, in certain cases, there's not, yeah, there is not a lot of lateral support to the beams between each other. They were built in bays, and the bays are supported uh, within themselves, within two beams. Uh, you've got a, a, a good amount of lateral support making it a rigid structure. But in between two structures, as you can see here, there's almost no lateral support at the lower levels, only at the, uh, at the roof level. And here you can see the holes. Anyway, the, the engineering got done. It was a long process. Um, actually, hanging the Phoenix was incredibly anticlimactic because we had spent months and months working out all of the engineering to make sure that these, these bridal points were exact and that we were doing exactly what we needed to prevent any, uh, any damage to the existing steel beams in the, uh, in the cathedral. One of the things that compounded the whole engineering process is that this is a very tall cathedral that does not have exterior flying buttresses. The buttresses, such as they are, are built inside on aisles next to the nave where the, where the, 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 um, the, the different uh, altars as they run up and down the nave, uh, the coves. And that's where the flying buttresses are located and they're hidden. They also evidently don't do as good a job um, at some point in time, the ceiling that you're looking at here had a crack down the ridge line that was opening up because the church itself was trying to force itself up because the walls were trying to open up. Um, I'm not sure how they fixed it. Wow. One of the things that one of the things that we did on this is we we uh, put load cells on all critical locations. We have what a dozen load cells on that job. There was about a dozen individual locations where we had almost full capacity on our chain motors. There was about 35 chain motors holding up the uh, truss grid. The truss grid was flown to about 65 or 70 feet in the air and, and deaded off, basically. And then we applied the uh, individual pieces of the sculpture to it. The main concern was instead of building it low and flying it all in one piece, all 40,000 pounds, we were concerned since we were using standard CM motors, the, the stop and start motions on the, on the hoist might have been a little bit too much for the church to take and no one could say, yeah, no, no, you, you'll be fine. So we built it, we basically built a flying grid, flew it and, 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 and deaded it and then all of the other uh, pieces of the sculpture were applied to it. Some of them, a lot of them were chain falls. We just pull it up and stop, yeah, and, and stop where we wanted it. Yeah. That, I mean, it was, it, 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 the hardest part really for this installation was getting the, the, the Phoenix from Massachusetts down to the cathedral on nine uh, overload, uh, wide load semis in the middle of winter and loaded it in through a front door that it was not quite big enough to get some of the pieces in. Once it got into the church, we had already done all our homework. So it was really just, okay, we know what we're doing. Go do it. Wow. I want to um, call out a shout out to Canna Gray, who is with us today. She took all these photographs. Oh, nice. thanks, Canna. As beautiful installation. 
you know, I've seen lots and lots of pictures of it and read articles about it, but I can't, you know, being up in the ceiling, I've, I've been in done rigging jobs where you're just kind of sweating it while you do it, even though you've done all the math, because you know the consequences if you're wrong. <laughs> we so, didn't have any of that. We've had that with other, other projects. This one, I had no concern whatsoever about the structure holding because of things that we had done there over the years, we were very comfortable with it. And, you know, it was, it really became just a making sure that we and the engineers were all on the same page. And, and ultimately that's what happened. Cool. So, um, we got other stories, but not for this, not for this, uh, venue. So I think we got about 10 minutes, Bill, is that right? Well, we have 10 minutes. We can run over if people want to hang around. I'm not, you know, there's, you know, but yeah, officially we have 10 minutes. I have, I have a, a couple of interesting questions. Um, actually, Paul, that's Paul Saps, is Michael's son, had a question that I think is, is relevant to people who, from the industry, says, what would you say to younger generations going into business with their family? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Michael, we should, we can, we can say this on the count of three. One, two, three. Don't. Oh. <laughs> let me let me let me do let me do something here real quick. Bill and I being identical twins, up until a certain point, it was he and I back to back against the world. You know, there was, you know, and this and this went up into college years. I'm sure that when we started working heavily together and both in the same room that sort of thing and you know that's when we started drifting apart because bill and i see the world a bit differently um which is you know fine that's the way it should be but there are plenty of people that get to work with family and uh and it all works out this isn't one of them <laughs> you know i mean we really shouldn't have it have done it but we did and we survived yeah. well one of the reasons and, that, and we broke a lot of coffee mugs right and one of the reasons that we survived was because we both recognized our strong suits and we did them regardless of what the other one said but we didn't i mean i didn't have to interact with michael a lot you know for the new york stuff all the production stuff once we got that ball rolling once we got through the the initial couple of years of doing production in new york i didn't have to worry about it again you know i was the guy who wrote the bid i didn't even do that half the time but i made sure the money came in and michael took care of putting the production together yeah we made sure you didn't show up yeah <laughs> I, need, so I need before we run out of time i need to tell the coffee mug story all right, go ahead. Which right. one? The one I'm about to tell, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so we're in one of the older shops. This is the, the uh, one of my, one of the rental places that, that we had a shop for a while. And the front door was also the loading dock. So you walked out onto the loading dock and then down a flight of steps and you could walk down the, the, the driveway to the road down there. And Michael and I were, having one of our, I don't know, hourly or daily fights and screaming and hollering at each other. And this one was particularly, you know, loud. And I was just as pissed as I could be. And Michael walks out, stomps out, I think is the appropriate way to describe that. He stomps out, gets out to the loading dock, down the steps and starts walking towards the road. I run out, I've got a coffee mug in my hand. I run out onto the loading dock and I throw it as hard as I can. And Michael, and I don't say anything. I just threw the damn thing at him. Michael turned at the last possible second, looked at me and ducked his head to the side and the coffee mug went right past his head. If he hadn't turned around, it would have clocked him in the back of the head and probably would have killed him. You know, and certainly if he turned around and had a cock in the front, yeah, it would have been all over. I mean, because I threw it as hard as I could. From that day on, we 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 agreed. We we had a, we we came to an agreement that if we're ever going to throw anything at each other, we have to call it first. <laughs> so you know, coffee cup. You know, all right, coffee cup. Now I'm going to throw it at you. Is that a fair um, 
telling of that story, Michael? Sure. <laughs> Was I married to you at the time? Yeah. Yeah. You were going to kill the father of my children, Bill? Uh, yeah, it probably would have. It wouldn't. It wasn't the first time I tried to kill him. And you know, your kids would have been without a father then. Ladies and gentlemen, after this is over, <laughs> please tune in to my version of all these stories <laughs> uh, the relationship between Bill and I, because I'm going to sit here and nod my head and go, yeah, okay, sure. Whatever you say. All right. I, I, one more semi-serious question. Um, both of you have done a lot of performer flying over the years of different oh. kinds with different people. And now Paul is off doing high tech, high speed performer flying all over the world. Pretty spectacular stuff. Um, the question was, I, you know, I've done performer flying too, and there's there's a necessity to create a relationship with the person you're going to fly, and instill some confidence in them that uh, it's safe, that, that you've got their back, and nothing's going to happen. How do what do you, how do you go about that with with people? What's your? Hang on, hang on. I, I have to actually get, get change this a little bit. We didn't. We did not do a lot of performer flying. Whenever um, we had to, when I was the the, um, the the production rigger for Victoria's Secret for fifteen years, and at some point we were flying angels. You know, for years and years we flew angels. It doesn't mean I flew the angels. It means you know Dave Hearn, Jamie Leonard, and the rest of the Foy guys. They came in and flew the angels. I was in charge of getting their rig in the air because they didn't do the rigging. Michael. Yeah. Let me interrupt. Why don't you talk about how you dealt with Naomi Watts? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, do tell. There was a photo. This sort of sort of counts. Naomi at Watts, they at the time Naomi Watts did King Kong. Condé Nast Traveler wanted to do a photo shoot on the gargoyles of the Chrysler building um, with the Empire State Building in the background. That's 65 floors up with Naomi standing out on the gargoyle, which is a eight foot long, three foot wide uh, sheet metal structure with lights in it and, and something, you know, something more substantial inside the darn thing. Um, typically what happens in these shoots is the artist gets there and they haven't really been told what's going on. They, they, they know they're going for a photo shoot and they want to take pictures. They, and that was about it. And that was very much the case here. Naomi showed up and they had me go back to her. You know, my introduction to Naomi was with harness in hand. And, you know, I walk into her dressing room, they're getting dressed, she's getting changed into something. And she looks at me, she looks at the harness, she looks at me and goes, okay, what am I doing here today? Um, I explained in five or 10 minutes, I explained what was going on, what it explained to me, how it was a, um, who's the photographer? Famous, Bill? It was, it was, it was not a, not a well-known person. It was not Annie or any of It wasn't Annie Lee, Lee Woods? No. No, it was not. Uh, okay. Anyway, we had put up a piece of truss sticking out a window uh, on the 65th floor, 65th or 66th, with uh, rigging in it to drop wires down to two people. One would be Naomi, the other would be whoever was out there on the gargoyle with Naomi, because there's no way she was going out by herself. And they would Photoshop that person out, and that person ultimately ended up being me. We had a nice conversation with Naomi and I thought she understood um, what was going on and how, you know, where we were going, how high it was. And, you know, I really thought we had, we, we looked in each other's eyes and I thought we had a moment. To get to the gargoyles, you go through an office, open some guy's window and go through, you know, get out the window like you would do any anyway. And there is a three by three platform with a, a knee wall, three foot high knee wall. It's a little terrace out there. You get onto that and then on the other side of that is the gargoyle. So I go out and I'm standing in the in the um, in this little uh, terrace and it's Naomi's turn to come out. And 
We get her, we pull her, bring her out, and she's sitting on the windowsill. She's looking around. And she finally looks up at me, and in that very small voice, now I know Naomi can have a big voice when she wants one, but when she wants, it's a real small little voice. She goes, you're out of your fucking mind. <laughs> <laughs> now, to complete the story, um, we, we hooked up. We were in jerk harnesses with a, uh, with a, a hook on the back, a, a dorsal hook, went up and then down to two guys who were you know, 10 feet away from us within, you know, everybody could see everybody and all that. And they were, they were on belay, basically. Um, Michael? Yeah? Who was, who was on belay? Paul Sapsis. He was maybe 18 years old, maybe. Yeah. Who was and the other Andy one? Schmitz. He's here. Well, yeah? Yeah. Just, Hi, Andy. Just say, just so you know. Am I, I throwing knew you were, him under I, the bus? I, I knew you were going there. Am I throwing him under the bus or not? Nah, I don't throw him under the I bus. Don't throw him. <laughs> oh, it's okay. a great story. Anyway, long story short, um, the rigging was there as. Uh, not fall protection, but to make sure that nobody went anywhere. There was always tension on the line. Um, and because we were walking around and because we had been called four days or so before the, before the gig, uh, we didn't have any motors or anything else like that. We didn't, we didn't have access to that stuff back in those days anyway. Naomi would go out onto the gargoyle with one hand on my shoulder, let go of me or, and I would be standing there next to her, Usually there was some, something touching each of us. She would go out, and when she got too nervous, she would turn to me and literally collapse in my arms, and we'd go back to that little terrace. We did that twice. And then we got back onto the terrace. Naomi looked over at the camera guy and said, hey, did you get it? And the camera guy hesitated and then went, yeah, we got it. And she looked up at me and went, eh, wait a minute. She you goes into the... Into the into the building around the corner and goes over and talks to the camera guy. And I turned to our guys. I said, guys, she's coming back out, you know, and to all of her credit, cause she was frightened to death, literally frightened to death. I mean, knees shaking, sewing machine knees, the whole thing. Um, she came out and did a third set of shots, which is the one they actually used ultimately. But, you know, as we like to say, she grew up, a, she grew a set and went out there. Yeah. Wow. I'm sorry, I can't make it any more dramatic than that. We tried to make it not dramatic because when we, when it's dramatic, we usually make the papers and we don't want to make the papers. We don't want to make the papers. Exactly. The, the time that I had to do something similar was when we flew the uh, the aerialists on the London Eye um, for that um, Olympics thing. And, you know, a bunch of people up on the eye. Uh, the rig was that was basically designed that kept them on the on the, the spokes of the eye was designed by uh, Paul, nephew Paul Sapsis. And, um, you know, we had worked on it a lot in rehearsal. They were ready for it. But to get people to understand, you know, what you really need to do is be honest with, pe with people, be sincere, and look them in the eye. You know, and be able to talk to them about what's going to happen, what the potentials are, and here's how we've here's how we've handled all the all the potentials and why there's no risk involved in going out there. You're and probably I, not going to die. Yeah, <laughs> probably not the best thing to say when you're when you're going out 250 feet in the air on the on the spokes of the eye. I watched Paul work with the talent at the Cathedral St. John for the Tower Bridge segment of that thing. Right. Um, Paul, and I don't, I don't even know if he's here or not. He's Paul not. is unbelievably good at working with talent. That's what he does for a living. And um, I watched him make everyone as comfortable as if they were sitting on their couch. That was my... Yeah, kind of just put the uh, the finished product in the chat if you're interested uh, with Naomi um, seemingly all by herself uh, standing on the uh, on the gargoyle. That's the that's the shot that made the cover. Thank you, Kana. How how do I get how do I see that? It's in the chat. Click the chat. You just click, you just click on it when you when you find it. You got to scroll through the chat to get there. Oh, uh, right there. 
How many people do we have left? Uh, 60. 60. Wow. Yeah. Do we have any? Uh, Wake them up. We can, we can keep going. That's a great shot. Yeah. Yeah, have you got any more, uh, any, any more questions? Any of the, the, the more, do you I'm want to get into the serious uh, stuff? If Sarah has any questions that, that have come in over the chat. But I do have some other questions if she doesn't. Oh, you, you mean, are there any questions in the chat? No, mostly people are telling us how much they don't like us. Oh, well, OK. <laughs> so, um, uh, you, your first self-climbing rig purchase. Oh, God. 1993. Yep. The, so let's the, the, the preamble to this is that Michael and his team, working with the New York Public Library, they are the people who invented uh, fashion shows and rep in New York City, contrary to what other people have said over the years. Michael did it, put it together with Blair Swope Emma. Emma. Oh my What's God. Yeah, um, in the Celeste Bartos Forum in uh, uh, the New York Mark Public Library. Too? Yeah. And we did everything in those days. The only thing we didn't provide were the models. Um, we did everything else runway, dressing rooms, the whole nine yards. Anyway. Um, this is early on in my career and you know i didn't have a whole lot of money and what you had what what the only thing there was no hanging points in the room so you built a truss structure and in those days we were putting it up on crank up towers and nobody liked the crank up tower idea um and you know but i didn't have the money to go out and buy a self-climbing system so michael in his infinite wisdom he sets up one of the shows, and this is this is what I heard later on. Um, I saw it when he brought me in. He called me in. He said, "We got a problem, man." And he and I, he called me up, and I, I came into the building, and I looked, and one of the towers, one of the crank up towers, had this great big bend in it. And I looked up and went, "Oh crap!" You know, I got my checkbook out right there, and I wrote a you know I wrote a check and bought a self climbing rig. And Michael walked away snickering because he had done that on purpose. <laughs> How to, how to separate a brother from his money. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, it, had, it had to be done. We were we had fought about it a little bit. Bill says, you know, we didn't have the money. I didn't care if we didn't have the money. I needed to do something. Our shows were getting bigger and bigger. We did two, three full seasons in the library um, with, you know, these are, you know, full bone flat, Anna Sui. Um, I don't think Calvin was, but all the big names but back Calvin in the day. Wasn't in there, no. Um, Mark Jacobs was in there, yeah. you know, and, 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 you know, they weren't small things they were compared you know, but, uh, we needed to do something and, you know, that's what we did. And it worked really well. And then the library decided to, uh, renovate the building. Right. Yeah. And we all moved to the, to Bryant park. God help us. You guys have done a lot of stuff on cruise lines over the years, but um, so, somewhere there's a story about the first video wall for the Roy Bill, Royal Caribbean cruise lines and uh, the fact that they were not going to go up on time. <laughs> That's a story I told last night, I think it was, during the company oh. picnic, the company Zoom. Um, we built these two video walls, and they were similar to the ones at the Palladium. Um, maybe they were a little smaller, but they were going into the theater and they were the full TV monitors. You know, it wasn't these little flat screen things. Um, and they tracked back and forth uh, on, on Goddard uh, uh, control system. AWD. And the first one that we did, we got the contract, we started building it, and then we get behind and we're getting behind and we're getting behind. We got so far behind schedule, I didn't know what to do. I couldn't call the guy. I was so I was scared to death, you know. And we were early on in our careers, and you know, you, all the all the things that you can think about that would go wrong if we were if we were late. We were so late it wasn't funny. I'm thinking about calling the guy who the technical director for for the ship. He called me up to tell me that the ship had just caught fire. <laughs> Half of the ship had burned. And he was so sorry, but he was going to have to delay our installation by several months while they cut the ship in half and put another one, another bow on, onto it. And I'm, I'm on the phone with him thinking, telling him, going, oh, it's okay. 
I, I don't mind. We'll, we'll store the gear. Everything will be fine. Well, needless to say, I got off the phone and I jumped 50 feet in the air screaming for joy because seemingly, you know, I was now off the hook. So I had another couple of months to finish this job. And for us, it was a big job at the time. Well, I guess it comes as no surprise that even though we had three or four months, we were still so late that we had to air, air freight everything over there to get it there in time. Oh, my God. Yeah. All right. So one last question, um, and this is for both you guys. What's the biggest change you've seen in the industry since you started? I mean, there have been a lot of technological changes and a lot of changes in the attitudes towards safety and thing. What's the single biggest change you've seen? Automation. Yeah. Uh, one word. Automation. On the installation side, we have we, we, we moved from hemp houses to counterweight systems. You know, hemp houses kind of predate me and Michael. Um, we, but we were still doing a couple of them in the really early days. But then they went away. And then we're doing counterweight systems. And then, you know, I guess it was... Uh, the Vortec, uh, Hoffman came out with the Vortec and set the stage for the switch into like, what they're calling package hoists that are going into theaters all over the place at this stage of the game. So we're seeing a significant increase um, in automate. I wouldn't call it auto automation. They're motorizing um, the systems. Automation is a different animal. And Michael, you, can, you and Paul could speak better to that, you know, in terms of what's going on in, in the in the concert world. Was that you throwing me a line? I yeah. did, yeah. <laughs> Look, Paul's the guy to talk to about that. But obviously, I toured in the mid-80s. You know, you know. Who'd you tour with? Heart, Kansas, Sticks. I did a couple days. God help me with, you know, 1976 with Paul McCartney and Wings, uh, which means I'm 800 years old. Um, you seem to recall Ann Murray was in there too, wasn't she? I did a Maritimes tour with Ann Murray. I don't remember when I did it, but I do know that instead of tour buses, we had your basic uh, 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 courtesy bus, air airport courtesy bus. <laughs> yeah. that's what we, we it was all hotels but we drove you know around the the, the canadian maritimes in these you know, rickety old buses that you know were not comp at night you know after a show and off we went and then we go to a hotel get a couple hours of sleep and then have to get up and do a show it was dumber than mud and <laughs> some of the places that we played none of the places when i toured a are except for uh what is the Izod Center now? Um, almost every place that I toured in is been torn down. Wow. You know, and none of those places, not one of them, was ever built with production in mind. So we had our own little challenges. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the touring industry, the, the huge changes in the touring industry, and I'm not the guy to talk about it anymore because I haven't been in the touring industry for 25 years. Not since the not since 1990 have I had to really deal with um, the touring industry and how it actually worked. When I went and worked for Sapsis Rigging, I became the New York City and primarily the New York rigger and uh, solving whatever problem was facing me that day. So I didn't I didn't get to play in it. Paul really plays in it now, and um, he's doing quite well. Yeah, he is. It's quite quite a quite a legacy um you guys have there with paul <laughs> i mean you know he, he's like leading the charge on this stuff just cutting yeah, you know, he is he took he took whatever i you know gave him as my, as a parent and as a rigger he ignored almost all of it and uh went off and and did it the right way yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right all right i'm I think that just about exhausts my questions for you guys. Thank you so much for sharing. That was, that was fun. Well, I hope that was good. Yeah. I, it's nice to get the other side of some of those stories that I've heard. Um, thank you, Michael. Um, looks like Bill's going to share something with us here. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. 
Here this you is go. Bill's idea. Bill's <laughs> idea. Under the number seven bus. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, folks, for joining us. We are the Uncle Bill's remote seminars will return in January. I have sessions scheduled through the month of January, and then we'll, we'll do more beyond. I will be announcing those sessions on Friday morning, but we are done for this year. So I want to, as it says there, I want to thank you all for, for your support. And for just the fun and frivolity, I've had a blast. I hope you have too. And, Guys, uh, thank you. And for, for those of you who know even more stories and could have really uh, thrown at least me under the bus, I appreciate you're not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever your holidays are, guys, try and have good ones. Stay safe. Bye, and, Mikey. Uh, Bye, Billy. We'll see you All guys. Right. Bye-bye. Take care now, guys.